So um, the topic that I'd like to talk about is arts and business collaboration. Uh, I don't know about you, but in my arts organizations, that collaboration was a little one-sided. It was typically uh, some business person coming to you to help you with your logo or your business plan or some other thing like that because you did not know from these things and you needed an injection of that sound business thinking to get you up to the next level. Well, uh, I'd like to take a minute and pause and ask ourselves, how has business been doing in America in the last few years? I think, as uh, Ricky would say, Lucy, you got some splaining to do. Uh, you, you may remember 15 years ago, there was something called the S savings and loan scandal in which uh, America's savings and loans institutions uh, racked up huge business deals that went south and we, the American taxpayers, had to bail them out to the tune of about $500 billion. So a few people made a lot of money and the rest of us paid their bill. There was no regulation and um, it seemed that the business press completely fell down on the job to, to alert us or to thoroughly examine what happened afterwards. So we're glad that we learned that lesson and we didn't have to go through anything like that again. Until we got to Enron, um, which at one point was at the top of the business heap and uh, the folks that ran that joint were getting an Alumni of the Year award from all the business schools. But um, we sorted that out, paid that debt off, and we moved on and hopefully we learned our lesson and didn't have to go down that sorry path again. Until we got to AIG and Lehman Brothers and Goldman Sachs, who stuck us with even bigger bills. Uh, the, 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 the bailout from the Treasury Department on this last mess was $7.2 trillion. And if you add that to what the Fed spent, another $7.2 trillion, that's $14 trillion. That's a one and a four and 12 zeros. Guys, we've been talking about chump change here in a day, about what the arts deserve and what the arts should get and the subsidies that we're, we're fighting for and the, and the respect that you're desperate for and that we, we deserve. Well, what's going on here? $14 trillion. Oh, and then there's this guy. While all this was happening, this fellow was once the head of the Securities Dealers Trade Association. He was on the board of the NASDAQ. He helped create the American stock exchange system that we now know and love. And yet, the Securities and Exchange Commission had 20 years and eight passes at him, and they couldn't figure out what Bernie was doing. And he stuck us and his investors with another $8 billion worth of bad debt, taking down charities and other institutions that take care for the needy and the poor with him. And while that was happening, we had another mess in the Gulf of Mexico where BP uh, polluted with an oil spill greater than Rhode Island and Boston. And again, who's paying, paying for that? Is anyone here from that part of the world? Well, my heart goes out to you because your world has been uh, irreparably damaged by the actions of BP, who blames their contractor, who blames Halliburton, who blames BP for cuts cutting measures uh, to try to get the job done faster. Uh, well, I guess you can say, oops, my bad. Um, you know, uh, huh, gee, you know, the market's going to self-correct, I guess, you know, after $14 trillion and a, and a despoiled Gulf of Mexico. So what we have here, I think, is a question of whose values are guiding the system. It's a question to me of, is it time to inject a discussion of values into the creation of value? Discussion, discussion about values and who gets to decide what is valuable in America. It seems that the folks that are in charge of assigning value are getting it all wrong. Um, our core value statements is now official, says US BizCo. And, and so I'm wondering, is it that American capitalism is fundamentally broken 
and beyond repair? Is the corporate model dead? Or are we training the young people who are going into business incorrectly and then rewarding them obscenely? Uh, this guy thinks so, Mark, uh, Michael Jacobs. He's a professor of business education. He's a former Treasury Department official. He wrote for the Wall Street Journal how business schools have failed business. Uh, I don't want to read this whole thing to you, but just look at the last section here. He says, um, investment bankers who have failed American workers and retirees who have witnessed their jobs and savings vanish. American business schools need to rethink what we are teaching and not teaching the next generation of leaders. American business schools, and I would say law schools, their, car their colleagues have failed American business and American consumers gravely. So I think it's time to think differently. And what I would like to propose as the idea that I would like to share with you is a new kind of business school. Uh, one that takes the traditional model, the analytical model of business that we are familiar with, and combine it with an art school. So we'll call it a blended model of uh, left and right brain thinking that we need to succeed in this economy. And I would like to propose two things that be at the core of the offerings. A generous appreciation of generosity and what I call giftedness. At the heart of the artistic act, I think it's a gener generous gift that the maker is giving to the receivers. Yes, we all would want to be rewarded for our efforts, and we hope to have a good livelihood and to prosper. But I, I think at the heart of the creative act is an act of generosity that is not taught at the University of Chicago's business school. So we want to combine an appreciation of the gift and generosity with studio thinking, and the kinds of skills and, and passions and mindsets that everybody in this room possesses and, and uses every day, sometimes without even realizing it. Now, I would propose a number of core uh, skills to be at the heart of such a curriculum. I just want to mention a few briefly. One, <laughs> creativity. Well, <laughs> hell, that's why we're all here, right? We take the creative act, perhaps, for granted. The ability to do something from nothing, the ability to make, to do, to, to perform, to imagine something and then to make it so, uh, as Captain Picard used to say. Um, to take a private vision and to turn it into a public reality. That's at the heart of entrepreneurialism. That's at the heart of the creative act. And you do it every day. Uh, you see, you, you, you see a, a pile of crap and you see an image and then the next thing you know you apply your skills your, your collaborative skills, and the next thing you know, it's a beautiful thing. How the hell did that happen? A group of strangers walk into a room, a, a, an artistic director or, or, or a choreographer or a director takes that group of strangers, and then three weeks later or four weeks later, it's a fantastic work of art, a theater piece, uh, a jazz ensemble. How the hell did that happen? How do you take groups of people who never met each other and turn them into a high performance team? These are things that creative people do all the time. Empathy. This was mentioned earlier today. The key skill that is not being taught at any business school that I know of is deep, deep empathy. And it's not, I'm not talking about tolerance, like I'll just tolerate you, but like I embrace you. I want to know you. I want to be with you. I want to know about your differences. I don't, it's not like I, I tolerate difference, but I sniff it out. I search it out. I, I want difference. Um, to see the uh, world through the eyes of the other. Anybody acted in here? Acted in here? Yeah. Who here has played like a, a murderer? or a nasty person. What did you play? Uh, Yulia Silva and Summerfolk. Yeah, and, and are you like that person? No. no, and how did you become that person in a believable way on stage? I considered what I would do if I was in her circumstances. You considered what you would do in her circumstances. At the heart of the artistic method, for those of you that are in the performing arts, it's just what you do. You absorb, and I would say this is true for all the art forms. You absorb, you internalize, you, you reflect back, and in some, in some instances, you see the world through the others, and, and aren't we taught not to hate the characters we play, even if you're playing Richard III? Anybody ever play Richard III? Well, you're not supposed to hate him either, right? So you feel the hurt and the happiness of others, 
and you're able to participate and, and know the world through the eyes of the others. And this is something that I have to tell you that if the business world doesn't get this, this down, there's no hope for our, the rest of us. We'll be making our art in our, in, our, in our garrets or in our spaces while the place floods and uh, the polar bears will, 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 will cough and we'll all cry. So <laughs> empathy is definitely needed. <laughs> Um, and then uh, the other thing I just want to mention is what I referenced in discussing the gift, a real appreciation of what we call intrinsic value. You know, something that is valuable that you can't perhaps put on a spreadsheet and you can't like measure like how many widgets we sold last year. Um, so it's the non-financial measures that are going to cost and count more and more than the financial measures. Uh, someone was talking about des experience design. The experience that wraps a product is now more important than the product itself. How do we feel about something um, is to be taken into account now. Um, two sneakers are before me. I, they're both worth the same amount of money. They both look the same. They both cost the same. I choose not to buy the, seek the sneaker that was made by child labor in, in, in Indonesia. That's part of the product offering. How you feel about things are now important. And it may not be uh, quantifiable. You may not be able to put that on a spreadsheet. And yet th these are things that artists know and trade in and traffic in all the time. Something that's impractical. Well, anybody here who, who's died, decided to go into the arts and you said to your, your dad or your mom, I'm going to the arts, and they turn to you, how are you going to make a living? You know, your brother's a doctor. Your brother's an accountant. Who here has had that experience? Yeah. I mean, it's the same thing with me. And the way my, my, my wife tells the story, her father was a lawyer, and, and, and she said to her dad, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to study the humanities. And he said, how did he put it? He said, tell me the field you're in so I know what kind of work you'll be out of. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, Dad. That's a real vote of confidence. But isn't that how it is? It's impractical. How are you going to make any money from that? You know, oh, all right, we'll indulge you, you know, all right, for, five, for a couple of years. And then you'll get serious, right? So you have a timeline, you know. It's like, well, it's half past you know, 2012, and I haven't made it yet, so you know what I'm saying? And an appreciation of the gift. So these are some of the core values that I think artists possess and, and practice and live and express through their work and their being. And those are some of the things that I want to inject into the business curriculum. And I had a chance to do this. At the Stewart School of Business at IIT, I just finished a 15-week class called Got Creativity, uh, Strategies and Tools for the Next Economy. This is a total experiment for the Stewart School. I do not have an MBA and um, have never done, you know, have never run a real business in this sense, only 12 nonprofits. So go figure. And so here's some of the things we did. We brought a choreographer, Daryl Jones, into the, into the class, and he did, he did a, a workshop, and he had us dancing with a lot of joy, and he taught us about peripheral vision and how that might be useful in the business world. Um, we went to the owners of Akira and talked to Eric and John, and they shared us with their lessons about love the customer and how to create a fantastic environment that brings the most creativity out of your employees and out of your customers. And those are some of the, some of the lessons they, learned, they told us. One of the things is, first, lose everything. Uh, Liz and Ross from IDO, two fantastic designers, told us about the number one skill that they teach at IDO. At the core of their work is empathy, listening deeply and naively and humbly to the customer. IDO would not succeed without deep empathy. But they also do prototyping and storytelling. We've heard a lot about failure in this, in this room today. Uh, their mantra is, fail early, often, and cheaply. <laughs> and their other mantra is, build it and then discuss it. Iterate, make it happen. Do it, build it, and throw it out there and see what happens. And that's what I learned there. And then they said, hire for talent and their ability to collaborate and to be open and to take crit criticism and to give criticism and share. That's what they hire for at IDO. One of the funnest things we did in the class is we used Robert and Ma Michelle Root Bernstein's book, Root, uh, Sparks of Genius, as one of our texts. So these guys studied master creators, Nobel Prize winning scientists, and distilled 13 competencies 
or core skills that they felt these great creators had in common. And every week, I assigned my students one of those skills. They had to journal, create, um, and produce work. Um, one day it was um, dimensional thinking, and they had to imagine themselves two inches tall walking across their living room floor, encountering these things that were now, you know, hovering over them. One week they had to learn juggling. Um, and this is a, an observing uh, assignment where they says, I planted and grew this, though it gave me some trouble, <laughs> which is what our students give us, right? We planted and we, or our children, we planted and they give us a lot of trouble. Um, but I had them do, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a, uh, Jason's juggling, and, and so it was a total challenge to these MBA students, but they embraced it and jumped into it wholeheartedly. And if I had to say what I learned from that experience and from what their work taught me in this work, I would say, try it, plunge into it, practice it, play it, and then be it. And I would say that if anyone has uh, doubts whether you can teach creativity, this experience proves without, a, without a, 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 a shadow of a doubt that you can. And one of my favorite works of art is from Alpa. When we did the imaging uh, experiment, she created this self-portrait of herself um, on Business Week. And maybe in a few years, she'll send us the real, the real cover. Um, and then in the final assignment, we had uh, teams perform work. They, um, four teams presented uh, performances, and Leanne here is an impersonating Chef Sh uh, Sha Saunders of Brown Trout Restaurant telling his story in the first person. But we had students presenting skits, uh, videos, um, and all sorts of things. And one team presented the, the entire sum of, of what we learned in the class in 20 minutes by doing a John Daly Stewart show complete with skits, breakaways, and, um, and improv. So here's my challenge and my request to this group. Uh, as we think differently about creating a new kind of business curriculum, um, what I would like is 20 students or 20 makers. I would like a funky space. I'd love some seed money. And I'd like a hallelujah, amen, brother. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>